traveling all week and attending some classes, so I am delighted to be able to come join you this morning and to share a message with you. But before we do that, we have a couple of announcements this morning. And the first announcement is that Vacation Bible School is coming up pretty quickly. It's uh, early in June. It's June 6th through the 9th. And I want to invite you to consider being part of that conversation and part of that gathering uh, because Vacation Bible School is a great way not only to get some energy back in your life. If you're someone that's finding yourself in this stage of life running a little slower or hard to get excited, there is nothing like spending four days with young children to remind you of that excitement and get you excited again. The other thing I want to tell you about Vacation Bible School is that it's a great opportunity to be uh, a light and salt to a larger portion of the community all around us that comes to Vacation Bible School and to demonstrate the love that we have as a congregation. So I invite you to consider that um, those of you coming to the board meeting, it's going to be on the second floor in the annex building. Specifically, I'm told rooms 22 and 24. Um, so if you're going to the board meeting tonight, don't go to the youth building. No one else will be there. Um, and finally, I want to just announce that Josh Jackson is our new youth intern, and he will be joining us starting next Sunday. So please take a moment next Sunday to meet Josh while he's here and to get to know him over the course of the summer. Some of y'all know that I grew up in this area, and I'm going to shed a, a little more insight on John's journey. When I was in junior high in the sixth and seventh grade, I actually attended what no longer exists, but it was called at the time Klein Junior High, and it sat over here on the same plot of land that the high school finds itself and one of the things when I was in junior high that I was encouraged to do was try new things. So I joined the track team, and I wasn't any good at it, but, you know, it's sort of junior high, so everybody participates, and I ran long distances, and it was a good excuse to get out of some class because if we went to a track meet, we got to leave school early. So there was a hidden benefit to that. Can anybody relate to that hidden benefit? And as I ran track for the junior high, one of the things that I was invited to try was relay racing, where there's four runners, and they run one after the other. So the gun goes off, the first one runs, they run a certain distance carrying a baton that looks like a little stick of wood. They give the baton to the next person who runs again, hands the baton to the next person. Have you got this mental picture in your mind? And one of the things that you might not appreciate and was sort of odd to me was that in learning to run relay races, a disproportionate amount of time was given to the passing of the baton. You know, how you had to hold your hand out just right and then you'd yell stick and then the person behind you passing the baton would whack you in the hand to where your hand stung, they whacked it so hard, but that was all about so you didn't drop the stick. And although that might seem like a really easy thing, if you've ever watched an Olympics race where the stick gets dropped or the handoff doesn't go well, you get some appreciation for actually how hard that is to pass the stick. You know, we're reaching a time of the year that a lot of people are going through transitions. We have folks graduating um, for the next couple of weeks. College graduations, many of them have already occurred. High school graduations are coming up real quickly. Any of you that are teachers can probably tell me how many hours left you have with your students before the year is done. Amen to that. We have some of you getting out and looking forward to summer vacations, a time to get away from work, go travel someplace perhaps, and do something new in your life. And there might even be a person or two with us this morning that is counting down the days to retirement. So we're in these times, I hear an amen from the front on that retirement. So we're in a time in our life that we start to think about transitions. And as inevitably we do, when we reach a time of transition in our lives, we start to think what's next. Some of you know that two weeks ago I graduated and finished my graduate career, um, according to me and my wife, who's watching us, so I'll say that for the public. Um, but people came up to ask me, so John, what's next? What are you gonna do next? And even all the way through my graduate career, there were actually very few questions about, so what are you learning? 
spending eight years in graduate school and lots of questions about how soon till you're done. When do you graduate? People were looking to the end. They were looking to that stick pass when I pass the baton onto the new phase of life. And they weren't really focused on where I was at that point. And that's something actually that comes up more commonly than I would like to believe. When we ask young people that are graduating from high school, what do you want to do? Well, I want to go be this. Or I want to go make a million dollars and be financially independent. You know, we're always talking about what's the end point, And we're not so focused on the journey. Sometimes that happens to us as followers of Jesus as well. I will spend a lot of time in conversations with people that are nearing the end of their lives or in the midst of a sickness, and they're talking about, well, my goal in life is to go to heaven when I die. And that's actually not really biblical. Jesus didn't come to talk about that. And so this morning, we find ourselves in our scripture verse that the people of Israel back in the Old Testament, they've escaped Egypt, they've escaped their exile, They've wandered around the desert for 40 years. Someone might say because guys won't ask directions. So they've wandered and wandered and wandered. And now they're at the edge of the promised land. They're almost there to the fi- what they perceive was the final objective of all this wandering. And Moses has some words of reflection to share with them right before they enter into the promised land. And this is what Moses had to say to them. This is from Deuteronomy. Now this is a commandment, the statutes and ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land you are about to cross into and occupy so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart, Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away. When you lie down and when you rise, bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorpost of your heart and on your gate. You know, these set of verses are known as the great commandment. For the people of Israel, if you ask them to sum up all of the teachings of what we Christians would call the Old Testament, This is what they'd say. And yet if you notice, all the way through that, Moses wasn't saying, here's the end goal. He was saying, here's how I want you to live. Here's how I want you to behave. And he was very, very clear because when we live and behave in a certain way, people around us notice. Specifically, he talked about your children and your children's children Notice, and they follow the way that you've taught them. So this morning I want to talk about with us, how do we live that legacy? We've each been given a legacy. There was some other runner in the race that slapped the baton into our hands. And instead of focusing how to pass the baton, I want us to focus this morning about how we run that race in the middle. How do we live that legacy Because I believe that when we live the legacy that we've been given, folks, we live as followers of Jesus. You know, when Jesus was asked at one point, what's the greatest commandment? What did he say? He he mentioned this. He said the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your might, with all your heart, with all your strength. And then he added something to the end. What did he say? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Right? So even Jesus talked about how do we live out this legacy, this way of being. And so this morning, I'd like to talk about the near-term legacy. We often talk about what's the legacy that Jesus left us. All of us have a nearer-term legacy. 
just like teams that are running relay races, um, I already mentioned to you, I was pretty slow. So no matter what place we were in when I got the baton, we got worse as I ran that race. But we've all been given that baton, the legacy that's ours to run with. And for some of us, it was a great legacy. We had great parents that passed us a legacy, and we're continuing that legacy and living it out. But not all of us grew up that way. In fact, my younger sister and her husband, after they had raised all their children, including an adopted child, now live on a ranch in South Texas where they raise children that are wards of the state. And what a blessing they are in doing that. So we've all been given a legacy, but the question for all of us is, how do we live it out? So I want to just share two with you this morning. Uh, my parents are here with us as they often are when I'm sharing a message. So they'll keep me honest in this story. But the first legacy that I think they left for me that I try to live out in my life was when we first moved to Texas when I was young. And you must know that I am one of six children. And so um, I, I have a, a large group of siblings, including my youngest brother who was playing mandolin with us this morning. When we moved to Texas, my parents decided that we should go see Texas. And so we had a little camping trailer. Can anybody relate to a little camping trailer? You turn a crank and the beds come out. The top goes up, one of those kind of camping trailers. And all sorts of colorful world, words sometimes get uttered when things don't work just quite right. But that's part of camping is things go wrong. And no matter where we were in the state, at some point on Saturday, we would get herded off to the showers to get cleaned up as children. Um, and you know those camping showers, they were of course always nice and warm and all that, right? No, uh, always ice cold. But Sunday morning we would find the closest Catholic church and we would go to worship. And because there were six of us, we wouldn't necessarily be on time to the worship service. But one of the things that we did as a family is we came down and sat on the front row. So we did make an entrance when we went to church. But you know, as I look back upon that, there were many things that my parents were teaching us in the midst of that moment. They were teaching us first that it's important no matter where you are or what you're doing to honor that great commandment, to love the Lord your God, to show up in worship and be in fellowship with other people that are walking that journey. Now, one of the things that would happen when we would show up in these churches, we'd make an entrance, and so people would want to come meet us after the service was over to see who this strange family was that came to worship with them this morning. And so we got to know a lot about fellowship and how believers come together with that one thing in common, even if we didn't know one another before it started. And so that was a great legacy that's been passed to me that I try to live out. When Stace and I first started worshiping here at Cypress Creek, the young people, you might recall, for some of you that have been here, would sit up in the balcony. And so as we became youth workers many years ago, we invited the, the young people and said, we're going to sit on the front row. If y'all want to, you can come join us. And you know, one of them said, are we allowed to do that? They even asked, were they allowed to sit down here? But they've been here ever since. So I like to think that that's a legacy that we were able to leave, is to invite our young people to be an integral part of this community and to be down here in front and a viable and invisible part of worship. Another legacy that my folks left for me, and quite frankly, I'm somewhat embarrassed to tell the story. And for you folks in the, that are a little younger, this is in a time before cell phones. When I was at A&M, um, we woke up one sunny Saturday morning and decided we were all going to go to the beach down in Galveston. It was a beautiful day. It was just after spring break. We had no responsibilities that day, which was rare. And so we were all going to go to the beach. And so two carloads of Aggies drove down to Galveston, and we had a great time at the beach. So then we load up in the cars on our way back. We're sunburned. We're covered in sand. There might have even been a little inebriation going on in those that were not driving. We were all paramedics at the time, so uh, nobody that had, had had a drink was driving. But if you can imagine this gang of college students, and I was an engineering student, and so I could do math. And I did this math that said, here's Galveston, here's A&M, and you know what smack dab in the middle? 
mom and dad's house. Let's go to mom and dad's house. We're hungry. We're covered in sand. We don't want to drive all the way back to College Station. Let's stop at mom and dad's house because they'll take care of us. Again, the days before cell phones, no phone calls were made to warn mom and dad we were going to show up. But my parents throughout their life had demonstrated a sense of hospitality and the sense of we always have room for one more. So we decided to push the one more by 11. And we showed up at their house in the afternoon, sunburned, covered in sand, and as it luck would have, my parents were actually doing premarital counseling for a young couple who did not know what was about to hit them. We show up at the house completely unannounced, but you know what my folks did? They could have gotten really angry at me. I don't remember that happening. It might have, but I don't remember it. They told the young couple, hang on a minute, we'll be right back with you. My mom grabbed the young ladies, pointed them towards the, th the showers that we had in the house, showed them where the fresh towels were, because of course, we gentlemen would go last. She did kindly point out where the garden hose was out back in case any of the guys got impatient. My dad went and got us all fried chicken because he decided we were hungry. And so we had an impromptu party and shower at John's parents' house on the way back to a &M. By the way, don't ever do this. This is a bad idea. Don't ever do that to your parents. But you know, it instilled not only in that young couple that they were training up in the ways of celebrating life together, but also all my friends, this sense of hospitality that Jesus talked about, this radical hospitality that it doesn't matter if we know you, it doesn't matter if we like your politics, it doesn't matter if you're old or young, the doors are open and we're going to fellowship together. And so I think those were two great examples in my life of a legacy that I've been given to live out as a follower of Jesus. And I suspect if you each took a minute to reflect, you could think of a time or two that you've been handed a legacy that you've been asked to live out. And folks, we all live between the baton passes. The baton is in each of our hands. We get to run the race until we pass the baton on to somewhere else. People are watching us to see what we do, particularly as followers of Jesus. When people find out that we're followers of Jesus, they're less interested in what we say and much more interested in how we act. So my invitation for you each this week is to notice and find that one time that you can live out a legacy that you've been handed. Live out a legacy in this community, at work, at home, at school, where someone will know by watching you that you follow this radical guy by the name of Jesus that set this example of being different in the world and of heaven coming to earth and they'll notice it enough that they'll be changed by it whether you ever know that or not because that happens all around us in this community it's one of the things that I am so excited about here at Cypress Creek so take the opportunity to this week to live out that legacy let's pray together God we are so thankful for the opportunity to come together and worship Father, there are many in our community this morning that are in need of healing, that are in need of comfort, that are in need of just knowing that you are with them in this time. And so, Father, my prayer this morning is in the midst of our longing to know what is next, for our searching for how you will use us next, that you open our mind, you open our heart, you open our eyes to see the opportunities to show your love to someone else. Father, you've given us the baton and my prayer this morning is that you fill us with a desire to live out that legacy in ways that people will know your love and your glory. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you.